Mr. President, Master Sergeant Benavidez, and distinguished guests, on behalf of the three million men and women who make up the Department of Defense, let me say to you, sir, welcome to the Pentagon. We gather today to add another name to the more than 3,000 inscribed in the Hall of Heroes through which we just walked. And their names not only remind us of the sacrifices our military personnel are always ready to make, but they call to mind those simple virtues that built this country, courage and commitment. And it is these simple virtues and this courage performed all over the world that enable us to be here today in peace and in freedom. Mr. President, it is especially fitting that you honor us today with your presence here because of your clear and long-standing support for those who wear the uniforms of the United States Armed Forces. And I share and support your pledge to restore the pride that we as a nation once felt and should feel again for those who serve all of us so selflessly and in the case of Sergeant Benavidez, so magnificently. Ladies and gentlemen, the Commander-in-Chief, the President of the United States. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Men and women of the Armed Forces, ladies and gentlemen, several years ago, we brought home a group of American fighting men who had obeyed their country's call and who had fought as bravely and as well as any Americans in our history. They came home without a victory, not because they'd been defeated, but because they'd been denied permission to win. They were greeted by no parades. They were greeted by no parades, no bands, no waving of the flag they had so nobly served. There's been no thank you for their sacrifice. There's been no effort to honor and thus give pride to the families of more than 57,000 young men who gave their lives in that faraway war. As the poet Lawrence Binion wrote, they shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. Pride, of course, cannot wipe out the burden of grief borne by their families, but it can make that grief easier to bear. The pain will not be quite as sharp if they know their fellow citizens share that pain. There's been little or no recognition of the gratitude we owe to the more than 300,000 men who suffered wounds in that war. John Stuart Mill said, war is an ugly thing, but not the ugliest of things. A man who has nothing which he cares about more than his personal safety is a miserable creature and has no chance of being free unless made and kept so by the exertions of better men than himself. Back in 1970, Kenneth why Tomlinson wrote of what he had seen our young men do beyond and above the call of military duty in Vietnam. A Marine from Texas, on his way in at dawn from an all-night patrol, stopping to treat huge sores on the back of an old Vietnamese man. An artilleryman from New Jersey, spending his free time stacking sandbags at an orphanage to protect the children from mortar attacks. An Army engineer from California, distributing toys he'd bought in Hong Kong to the orphans his unit had adopted. One senior military officer told Tomlinson, my hardest task is keeping track of the incurable humanitarianism of our troops. None of the recent movies about that war have found time to show those examples of humanitarianism. In 1969 alone, United States Army volunteers helped construct 1,253 schools and 597 hospitals and dispensaries, contributing $300,000 from their own pockets. Marines from the 3rd Amphibious Force helped build 268 classrooms, 75 dispensaries, 
seventy eight churches temples and pagodas marines contributed forty thousand dollars to ensure an education for nine hundred and thirty five children air force men gave their money and their own labor to twelve hundred and eighteen schools medical facilities and orphanages air force doctors dentists and medics treated three hundred and ninety thousand vietnamese in volunteer programs at wa Khan, Children's Hospital treated in that one year some 16,000 children, many of whom might have died without the hospital. One of the finest and most modern. In the Far East, it was built and financed with money raised by combat Marines. An 11-year-old boy burned over three quarters of his body was one of those saved. He interrupted the game he was playing with visiting Marines to say, all my life, I will never forget this place and these healing people. Some way, I will repay them. A 27-year-old chaplain from Springfield, Missouri, came upon an orphanage where 60 children were sleeping on the floor of a school and subsisting on one or two bowls of rice a day. He told some men of the Americal Division's 5th Battalion, 46th Infantry, about what he'd seen. A veteran sergeant said, don't worry, chaplain. Those kids have just got themselves some new parents. And they had. Army combat troops began sacking enemy food they had captured and shipping them back on return hel returning helicopters. They found cots in a salvage dump, repaired them, and soon the children were sleeping in beds for the first time. One day, the cup was passed. Marines earmarked 10% of all poker winnings, and by the end of the year, the orphans were in a new building. An Air Force pilot saw 240 lepers living in unimaginable filth Soon there were volunteers from all branches of the military spending their weekends building houses at a hospital. The stories go on and on. A Green Beret learned that a mother in a remote mountain village was having trouble in childbirth. He made his way to her home, carried her to a truck and raced to Camran where a Navy doctor delivered the baby. On Christmas, he gave 1,500 orphans toothpaste, soap, candy, and nuts he'd collected from fellow servicemen. Bob Hope, who visited our men there as he had in two previous wars, said of them, the number of our GIs who devote their free time, energy, and money to aid the Vietnamese would surprise you. And then he added, but maybe it wouldn't. I guess you know what kind of guys your sons and brothers and the kids next door are. Well, yes, we do know. I think we just let it slip our minds for a time. It's time to show our pride in them and to thank them. In his book, The Bridges at Tokori, novelist James Michener writes movingly of the heroes who fought in the Korean conflict. In the book's final scene, an admiral stands on the darkened bridge of his carrier waiting for pilots he knows will never return from their mission. And as he waits, he asks in the silent darkness, where did we get such men? Almost a generation later, I asked that same question when our POWs were returned from savage captivity in Vietnam. Where did we find such men? We find them where we've always found them, in our villages and towns, on our city streets, in our shops and on our farms. I have one more Vietnam story, and the individual in this story was brought up on a farm outside of Cureo in DeWitt County, Texas, and he is here today. Thanks to the Secretary of Defense, Cap Weinberger, I learned of his story, which had been overlooked or buried for several years. It has to do with the highest award our nation can give, the Congressional Medal of Honor given only for service above and beyond the call of duty. Secretary Weinberger, would you please escort Sergeant Benavides, Benavides forward? Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to have with us today Master Sergeant Roy P. Benavides, U.S. Army retired. Let me read the plain, factual, military language of the citation that was lost for too long a time. Master Sergeant Roy P. Benavides, United States Army retired for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity in action at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty. Where there is a brave man, it is said, there is the thickest of the fight. There is the place of honor. On May 2nd, 1968, Master Sergeant, then Staff Sergeant Roy P. Benavides, 
distinguished himself by a series of daring and extremely valorous actions while assigned to Detachment B-56, 5th Special Forces Group Airborne, 1st Special Forces Republic of Vietnam. On the morning of May 2nd, 1968, a 12-man Special Forces Reconnaissance Team was inserted by helicopters in a dense jungle area west of Lac Ninh, Vietnam, to gather intelligence information about confirmed large-scale enemy activity. This area was controlled and routinely patrolled by the North Vietnamese Army. After a short period of time on the ground, the team met heavy enemy resistance and requested emergency extraction. Three helicopters attempted extraction, but were unable to land due to intense enemy small arms and anti-aircraft fire. Sergeant Vietnavides Vitas was at the forward operating base in Lac Ninh monitoring the operation by radio when these helicopters returned to offload wounded crew members and to assess aircraft damage. Sergeant Benavides voluntarily boarded a returning aircraft to assist in another extraction attempt. Realizing that all the team members were either dead or wounded and unable to move to the pickup zone, he directed the aircraft to a nearby clearing where he jumped from the hovering hel helicopter and ran approximately 75 meters under withering small arms fire to the crippled team. Prior to reaching the team's position, he was wounded in his right leg, face, and head. Despite these painful injuries, he took charge, repositioning the team members and directing their fire to facilitate the landing of an extraction aircraft and the loading of wounded and dead team members. He then threw smoke canisters to direct the aircraft to the team's position. Despite his severe wounds and under intense enemy fire, he carried and dragged half of the wounded team members to the awaiting aircraft. He then provided protective fire by running alongside the aircraft as it moved to pick up the remaining team members. As the enemy's fire intensified, he hurried to recover the body and the classified documents on the dead team leader. When he reached the team leader's body, Sergeant Benavides was severely wounded by small arms fire in the abdomen and grenade fragments in his back. At nearly the same moment, the aircraft pilot was mortally wounded and his helicopter crashed. Although in extremely critical condition due to his multiple wounds, Sergeant Benavides secured the classified documents and made his way back to the wreckage where he aided the wounded out of the overturned aircraft and gathered the stunned survivors into a defensive perimeter. Under increasing enemy automatic weapons and grenade fire, he moved around the perimeter, distributing water and ammunition to his weary men, reinstilling in them a will to live and fight. Facing a buildup of enemy opposition with a beleaguered team, Sergeant Benavides mustered his strength and began calling in tactical airstrikes and directing the fire from supporting gunships to suppress the enemy's fire and so permit another extraction attempt. He was wounded again in his thigh by small arms fire while administering first aid to a wounded team member just before another extraction helicopter was able to land. His indomitable spirit kept him going as he began to carry his comrades to the craft. On his second trip with the wounded, he was clubbed from behind by an enemy soldier. In the ensuing hand-to-hand -hand combat, he sustained additional wounds to his head and arms before killing his adversary. He then continued under devastating fire to carry the wounded to the helicopter. Upon reaching the aircraft, he spotted and killed two enemy soldiers who were rushing the craft from an angle that prevented the aircraft door gunner from firing upon them. With little strength remaining, he made one last trip to the perimeter to ensure that all classified material had been collected or destroyed and to bring in the remaining wounded. Only then, in serious condition from numerous wounds and loss of blood, did he allow himself to be pulled into the extraction aircraft. Sergeant Benavides' gallant choice to join voluntarily his comrades who were in critical straits, to expose himself constantly to withering enemy fire, and his refusal to be stopped despite numerous severe wounds saved the lives of at least eight men. His fearless personal leadership, tenacious devotion to duty, and extremely valorous actions in the face of overwhelming odds were in keeping with the finest traditions of the military service and reflect the utmost credit on him and the United States Army. Sergeant Benedictus, a nation grateful to you and to all your comrades, living and dead, awards you its highest symbol of gratitude for service above and beyond the call of duty, the Congressional Medal of Honor.